We're about to begin. Everyone could please take your seats. Everyone take your seat. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to invite your council member, Carlos Menchaca. And your mayor, Bill de Blasio. Now, I'm going to invite Brittany Espinoza to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which to, to stand for, for one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone, let's hear it for Brittany. Great job, Brittany. So I'd like to thank our hosts this evening, MS88, Eileen Mitchell, Principal, and PSK53, Heather Lycom, Principal. Also, I want to thank all the local community and civic organizations that came out tonight. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to your council member, Carlos Menchaca. Woo! Buenas noches. Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Uh, I know we are in the holidays, and so I just want to say that I hope that you and your family and your friends uh, get to celebrate the year. This has not been an easy year for many people, um, and we want to make sure that in these holidays, whether you're celebrating Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, uh, or just celebrating life, uh, that you are honored. Tonight we have a special privilege to experience not just the mayor, but his entire administration. This is an opportunity for us to learn more about the things that are important for us. And I have to tell you, Mr. Mayor, this is an incredible community that is vibrant with ideas, with questions, with inspiration. MS88, where we are right now, let's just give them another round of applause for hosting us tonight. Thank you so much, Ms. Mitchell uh, and her entire team. MS88 has a core group of values from integrity to curiosity, uh, empathy, resilience. These are the things, respect, these are the things that we all share in District 38. And so I'm so excited because tonight you get to ask your question. Tonight, the mayor gets to leave with his administration about the values that we share and the things that we need in our communities. Now, we've already accomplished so much in the last four years. Now, I wanna ask you really quick, uh, if you worked on these projects, I just want you to stand up and I'm gonna go through a few incredible victories. One, uh, Anybody here work on the playground in Sunset Park, either sending me an email, uh, going to a community board, or making your voices heard? Stand up. Stand up. Second, how many of you are working on the stoplight on Van Brunt? And stay standing up, by the way. Stay standing up. How many of you uh, participated in an assembly in participatory budgeting uh, in the last four years? Stand up. How many of you voted in a participatory budgeting uh, uh, initiative year, stand up. How many of you have an IDNYC in your wallet, stand up. Stand up, Mr. Mayor. Okay. How many of you are immigrants in this community and are proud of that, stand up. How many of you, how many of you have done the work in your community to either vote uh, in an election, stand up? If you have voted in your, in your community, stand up. Uh, and finally, how many of you are willing to commit tonight to do something in your community to make it better and make your voices heard? Stand up. Stand up. This is what I present to you, Mr. Mayor, a group of people who are putting their voices first, and when that happens, you can sit down now. 
thank you. And I love that the administration participated in this too. We know that they vote, and maybe they voted in participatory budgeting as well. But what I'm saying is, so much of what we've done together, we've done it by putting community voices first. And that is what we're gonna to continue to do, and that's what we're here today. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you a mayor that you know, a mayor that you voted for, a mayor that's coming back for another four years to continue the good work that we're doing, that is a champion for immigrants, that is a champion for affordable housing, that has transformed and continues to transform with our help uh, at the city council. Uh, to make our police department community oriented. And that's happening here with the 76 and the 66 and the 78, uh, oh, sorry, the 76. Those are things that are happening here. This mayor is who we are looking for for the next four years. Let me present to you tonight Mayor Bill de Blasio. Well, everybody, I was so moved when Carlos asked people to stand up and to show what each and every one of you is doing to make the community better and to make the city better. So Carlos, I really want to tell you, that's a very powerful way to show people how much power they have uh, and how much impact they make. So let's give him a round of applause for that great thing he just did. Everybody, I want to say a few things at the beginning, and, and first of all, a profound thank you to everyone for being here, because this is, this is what, you know the phrase, this is what democracy looks like? Well, this is literally what democracy looks like. People who come out, it does not matter that it's cold outside, it doesn't matter that you have worked a long day and you've had a busy day, you're here because you care so deeply for the community and you want to make an impact. That moves me, that impresses me. And I've had this experience all over this city. And you know, there are some cynical voices out there. But if you ever want to be inspired again, you just have to come to one of these meetings and you'll see it tonight, how much people care, how much they get involved. Uh, for me, this is particularly joyous this evening because it's a homecoming. I live seven blocks away. And this is uh, a school that's a, such an important part of our community. And yet, it's true, temporarily, I have been relocated to government housing in Manhattan. That is true, <laughs> at Gracie Mansion. But my real home is seven blocks away. And, uh, and I, have, I love MS-88, and, or as we say in the neighborhood, 88s. Uh, and um, really appreciate this community on so many levels. And whenever I'm here, it reminds me of when my kids were growing up, uh, and what an incredible community this is. I was also a community school board member back when we had community school boards, and I had all of District 15, including Sunset Park and Red Hook and so many other communities. So to be here with a council member is, for me, very personal. Um, at the beginning, I want to say to everyone, we're in the middle of the holiday season. The holiday season is an amazing time on many levels. One of the most amazing things is that New Yorkers actually slow down a little and chill out a little and appreciate uh, each other and the world around us a little bit more. Now, some people, particularly in Washington, D.C., have gotten a little weird lately. I won't name any names, but some people have gotten a little weird about holiday greetings. I feel very good about holiday greetings. I feel the same spirit of Carlos Manchaca, that we are all in this together. So at the outset, I want to give you my personal way of going about the holiday greeting thing that I think works, which is to just acknowledge everything. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy New Year, Feliz Navidad, Happy Holidays to everybody. I'm going to go over a few things, and then we're going to open it up, and, and Carlos will moderate and call on people. Um, and I just want to say at the outset, I know Carlos will say this again too, that one of the things that makes town hall meetings really work is that we try to get to as many people as possible. So we're going to go till 10.30 tonight, and stay as, if you want to stay as long as 10.30, we'll be going as long as 10.30. But what helps is if everybody, when you get called on, whatever your concern or your question, if you can get right to it, I'll do my best to give you a good, quick answer. My colleagues from the administration will join me. And then we can get on to as many other people as possible. 
Because one of the things you'll find is so many people have an issue they want to raise, help your neighbor out by getting to it quickly so they also can get their chance. Now, I mentioned the members of my administration. First of all, I want to give a special appreciation because they're having an amazing year, a record year, keeping people safe. Let's thank the leadership of the NYPD that's here with us. And then over here, as you heard from the council member, the leaders of many of the agencies that have the biggest impact on your lives, they're right here. Now you get a special bonus with every town hall meeting. When we get to 10.30, uh, the formal meeting ends, but they're still right here if you want to come over and see them. And you don't need to make an appointment, you don't wait, need to wait for weeks, they're just standing right here. So whatever your issue is, come over. Uh, if there's something you want to follow up on or something that didn't get raised in the meeting, come see them. Now, yes, it will be 10.30 at night, so you might naturally say, it's kind of late, they've been working a long day, they're great public servants, they're very devoted, is it fair to ask them a question so late at night? Well, I want you to know something. They're so committed to their jobs, they love what they do so much, they will stay here all night if you want them to. So, come on over. Now, I want to say about your council member. Uh, this is a man who is very passionate about his work. And you heard it there in the beginning. I was very moved by that, as I said. Uh, I met uh, Carlos Menchaca uh, after Sandy hit, and I saw the extraordinary work you were doing in Red Hook. Uh, you have taken the very best about being an activist into this work as a council member. And you have helped to move on a whole host of issues, uh, important issues for this community, but beyond. Uh, I'll give you one, IDMYC, we talked about it, and this is one of the leaders who brought the idea of IDMYC to this city. And because of his leadership, and I love this fact, 1.2 million New Yorkers now have an IDMYC. Let's thank our councilman for all he's done. So now I'm gonna give you some quick updates uh, and then we're going to open it up, but very quick. But I will just give you a little bit of, a little bit of information I think you'll find valuable. And it's a, also um, a framing of some of the things I know that matter to you tonight. Obviously, in this community, pretty much every community in New York City, affordability is the number one issue. People are concerned deeply to be able to still live in their own community, afford their own community, not get displaced from the community they love, and in so many people's cases, a community they help to create, to build, to protect in good times and bad. And so we have been working here in the council district to preserve affordable housing. That means to subsidize. When we say preservation, it's a really simple. We subsidize. Someone's in an apartment from the community, they need help to stay in the community. We provide a subsidy so they can stay in their apartment long term and keep it affordable and pay no more than 30% of their income in rent. That's the plan. So far, we've got about 500 apartments in this council district that have been preserved and subsidized. We're going to continue over the next years because we have a huge affordable housing plan citywide, 300,000 apartments will be either built or preserved and subsidized in place. So far, 500 in this council district, more to come. But also crucial because about 20% of people in the surrounding community, particularly in Sunset Park, live in rent-stabilized housing. And the council member and I know we have to protect rent regulation and, in fact, strengthen it in Albany in the years ahead. But one of the things that's powerful for folks in rent-stabilized housing in particular, the rights that come with that allow us to protect people against harassment, against eviction. The city council has been very strong on this point, working together. The right to council law was passed. I was happy to sign it. The right to council law is a huge, huge step for this city. And we have already been providing free legal services, but because the right to counsel is gonna grow. So already in this one council district in the last two years, 1,273 residents have gotten free legal services to stop evictions, to stop harassment, to get repairs they deserve. That's just a beginning. And it's a chance to protect people who have affordable housing now and make sure it is not taken from them. So we're gonna be all over that. And thank you, let's give him a round of applause because the council passed that incredibly important bill. 
Now, the other way to think about affordability, and we believe this strongly, is to get people better paying jobs. Uh, a lot of us, including a council member and I, fought very hard to increase the minimum wage. But the increase in the minimum wage was only a beginning. It only says we want to make sure that people have at least the beginning of a decent level of wages and benefits, but we want to go a lot farther. And so my goal is to create more of the kinds of jobs that give people a good, stable income that a family can live on. Manufacturing jobs, uh, jobs in the healthcare field, and film and TV, and technology, and life science, and all sorts of things in the garment manufacturing industry. There are so many industries where if you get into them, someone is talking about 40,000, 50,000 a year to begin and to be at a sustainable level. This is what we want to see more and more of. Again, we, we honor all work and we respect all work that people do and we want to make sure all work comes with a decent minimum wage and decent benefits. But the goal is to get more and more people to a better paying job and one that's really stable for their family. That's why what's going on at Bush Terminal is a good example, the whole Made in New York campus. Here in this broader community, it's a $136 million investment. The focus there is garment manufacturing and film and TV jobs. There will be 1,500 permanent jobs here in the broader neighborhood as a result of that investment. 1,500 good paying jobs. That is a difference maker. The Brooklyn Army Terminal, that's a $100 million investment. Also, industrial jobs, manufacturing jobs, that's another 1,000 high quality jobs that people who live in this council district can get to and that can be sustainable for their families. So that's another crucial piece. We see affordability as lower the price of housing in any way we can and protect affordable housing, but also increase the amount of money people have to spend so that they can take care of the number one expense in their life, and that is obviously housing. Also, our public housing. I want to tell you up front, in case this is a concern tonight, so I, with your help, have been given the privilege of serving for four more years. I have a very clear, simple statement about public housing in this city, about NYCHA. We will not allow NYCHA to be privatized. NYCHA is public housing. We will protect it as public housing. And it's one of the biggest sources of affordable housing in the city, 400,000 people. We are also need to do a lot more to make NYCHA buildings better. We have to put a huge amount of investment in. Federal government's walked away in so many ways. We're doing our best in every way we can to invest in NYCHA. One of the biggest needs, and again, this gets back to when Carlos and I first met uh, after Sandy and Red Hook. One of the biggest needs is resiliency. Red Hook Houses got the single largest award ever from FEMA, from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and that is being implemented now, $550 million, over half a billion dollars just for Red Hook Houses, just for resiliency. That work is being done. That's going to be a big, big deal going forward to protect the community. A couple more things I want to say. Uh, one also related to public housing. And I think some people know this, but I just want to make sure others hear it for the first time if you hadn't. Uh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, and this is important for seniors, uh, in Red Hook and in Red Hook Houses. Uh, the Red Hook Senior Center, will the ribbon cutting will be happening tomorrow for the reopening of the Senior Center. Beautiful. It's going to be beautiful, and it will be open for good in January. So we're really excited about that. Well, okay, a couple other quick topics. Public safety, obviously. Again, on everyone's mind always, PD has been doing an amazing job in your district council member. Crime, overall crime down across the board here in the 7-2 precinct. Major crimes down almost 6% this year compared to last year. Let's give them a round of applause. That's a big, big decrease. And as, as the council member said, with a focus, and we'll happily talk about this tonight, neighborhood policing, a focus on improving the relationship, the communication, the personal connection between community and police. That's what makes us safer. That's what's best for everyone. That's going to be a big focus in the next four years. On education, I want to just say a couple of things. Uh, we are so proud. Our school systems, we got a lot of work to do, but we know we're making progress. We have the highest graduation rate we've ever had. 
Want to thank all the educators in the room. Give them a round of applause. And three very quick points. Pre-K, which is the thing I cared about the most. I have all the issues I have to deal with in the city, but the one that was first in my heart was pre-K. And in your council district, here's the update. Four years ago, you had just about 600 full-day pre-K seats. Today, you have almost 2,600 full-day pre-K seats. Uh, 3K is coming next. I'm really excited about this. Three-year-olds, early child education for all three-year-olds for free. Did I mention it's free? Free, gratis. Uh, so uh, that's going to be happening every school district by September 2021. So it's going to take a little time to build out. We've already started, but I think it's going to be a game changer. And as everyone in this room knows, if there is a three-year-old in your life, if you try to find uh, a, a program, uh, you know, a Head Start, a daycare center, whatever it may be for a three-year-old, in a lot of cases that will cost you $10,000 or more a year right now, or $15,000, and most families can't even come near paying that. This will be 100% free, and by September 2021, it will be universal in this city. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, to make space for uh, pre-K, for 3K, but also in this community, there's been a, a need for more and more classroom space for a long time. We've been constantly adding a school capacity in this district. Since 2014, when we came into office, two full schools have been open and six pre-K centers have been open just in the last four years. And with the council members' help, we have money in the budget for enough schools for 2,400 more kids in this one council district. Yep. You can, you can say yeah, something. I'm just going to say that's, that's a huge, I think there's about a quarter of all the seats that are going to get built are going to get built here in this council district uh, with uh, District 15 and 20. And that's about six new schools that are on their way in some process or another. That's right. uh, and that's just the incredible relationship with the school construction authority. So thank you. Thank you. And one last thing about education. This is, and I'm almost done here, but don't want you to hear this. After school for middle school kids. Sixth, seventh, eighth graders. It's not well known enough. We have to do a better job telling people. If you have a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader anywhere in New York City, they get after school for free now. It is not always in their same building. I want to be clear. Some schools, it's like you literally go out of your classroom right into your after school. Other places, you have to go somewhere else in the neighborhood. But it's free and it's universal. In this community alone, again, Four years ago, there were about 250 after-school seats for middle school kids. Now there's over 1,000. So we're making a big difference with after-school. Okay, we're down to the wire here. Uh, getting around this city of ours and this borough of ours, there's lots we can talk about that tonight, but I want to just talk about one thing quick, which is our NYC ferry system, which is growing rapidly, has been a big hit. This is one of the parts of the city that has seen the biggest impact. The Rockaway route stops at Brooklyn Army Terminal and has had a huge ridership. Uh, the South Brooklyn route stops at Brooklyn Army Terminal, but also in Red Hook, which has been a big deal to get Red Hook additional transportation, both uh, that since they started in the spring, huge amounts of ridership. We think it's gonna be something that's really gonna keep growing and give great options to people. So we're happy about ferry service. <laughs> finally, 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 parks. One thing I wanna say about parks. Everyone here, I bet if you are like me, you have spent a lot of time in the parks. If you're a parent or there's a child in your life, you've especially spent a lot of time in the park. I, for my children, Chiara and Dante, they grew up a lot of their life in the park. They played Little League in the park. I coached Little League in the park. I always say when I was coaching seven, I was coaching seven-year-old team in the 78th Precinct Youth League. And one thing I learned is that seven-year-olds were not following my instructions and my vision for them. I, I was a strong leader, but the seven-year-olds weren't getting it. 
So it was a humbling experience, but it was a wonderful experience being part of Little League and everything else in the park. So we understand how central this is to all of our lives. And a park, uh, an area that means so much to people in this council district is Bush Terminal Parks, but there's more work to be done there to make it everything it should be for the community. And I know a lot of people in the community have said, we need help to make that park all it should be. And so I am announcing now and I want to thank uh, the council member for raising this to us. So we want to make sure we can do something important for the community. I'm announcing a $6 million grant for lighting in the park. And I just want to add that the lighting and the conversations that people are having in our neighborhood, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that we want to use that park uh, beyond a sunset. Uh, and those fields are so important to us, and so that's going to be a huge opportunity for our, our family. So well, thank, you. thank you so much for that. Thank you, Carlos, and that's the whole idea. This means because we'll be able to keep the park uh, really for, for athletic activity and all be open later and people will be able to use it, it basically means doubling the amount of time that will be available on those fields. Awesome. So thank huge you for victory. your advocacy. Huge victory for our community. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. Last thing I want to say before we open up to everyone. So, and this goes beyond just this community, even goes beyond New York City. Uh, we saw something happen this year that for all of us uh, was painful, was challenging, and we felt it deeply, even though it happened a thousand miles or more away, which is when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. And I think New Yorkers, regardless of what our background is, we felt solidarity with Puerto Rico. We felt the pain and the fear that people were feeling in Puerto Rico. All those days when people couldn't even reach their family members and didn't even know what was going on. So New York City, we said in the very beginning, regardless of what our country does, and I would have liked to have seen our country do a lot more, and our country still can do a lot more for our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico, but New York City, said from the beginning, we're going to be in the front, we're going to be in the first wave to help. And here's something I'm proud of. From the day the hurricane hit to today, over 300 New York City employees have gone to Puerto Rico to help the people of Puerto Rico. Isn't that amazing? And we have supported them in every way, and we've sent, with all your help, so much in the way of supplies and emergency needs to Puerto Rico. Look, I'll finish with this. Again, we're here to talk about the communities here in this district, but we have a, a big heart for Puerto Rico, and I've said, this crisis is not going to be over this year. It's going to be years, but we're going to be with Puerto Rico every step of the way. So I say, presente, council member. All right. And thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for your uh, just kind of overview of the different ways that our community has changed relationship with all the agencies uh, in the projects that you heard tonight. But tonight we want to hear from you. So, uh, show of hands, how many people here have a question that they want to ask? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. Okay, great. We're not going to get. We're not going to be able to get to everybody tonight. But I want to reiterate what we want to do. We want to make sure that you ask a question. Uh, so we want to make sure that you don't bring a speech. We want to make sure you get to your questions so that the mayor can answer that. Second, we want to make sure we get to multiple topics. So let's try to get to one question per topic so we can get through the topics. And then finally, I want to let you know that it is a commitment that everyone here tonight will stay as long as needed to get to your question if you want to stay here after we're done and we haven't gotten to you. You have white cards in front of you to make sure that you answer or you write your question if we can't get that answer to you uh, on stage, but we want to make sure that we get to all the questions. Is that fair? Okay, let's make this happen. So uh, let's get the first round of questions here tonight. Um, we actually have a question over here from MS88 uh, student. You want to answer your question? Or, Ask your question over here. Make sure we hear your name. Hi, um, my name is Jared Burks, and I'm a sixth grader here at MS88, and I take a dual language class. It's fun to learn Spanish, and I know being bilingual will help me get a better job in the future. Will you continue to support and expand these previous programs? All right, excellent question, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. What grade are you in? What grade are you in? Sixth grade? Okay. Any sixth grader who is at a town hall meeting on a weeknight asking questions is a very good citizen. Give a round of applause. Okay, so we are supporting those programs very energetically. We will continue to. Now, your second question is, will we expand? Can't say yet, and I want to be real. Why? Because we don't know what our financial reality is because of a very uh, troubling piece of legislation that's being looked at right now in the U.S. Congress. And a lot of people are watching this carefully. The quote-unquote tax bill that's being uh, passed by the Republicans I'm very worried about it. I think it's gonna be very unfair to a lot of people. I think it's gonna be a giveaway to big corporations and the wealthy. And I think it's gonna take a lot of money that had previously gone to education and affordable housing, a lot of other things. I think it could potentially, could really hurt us in our ability to do things. We don't know yet. That still has to play out. But are we going to continue the kind of initiatives we have right now? Absolutely. And I'm glad that you are learning so well. Congratulations. Thank you for that question. Okay, let's come over here on this side over here. Um, we have right here, this lady. Thank you so much. Hello, Mayor. Uh, my name is Kelly N. York. I'm a current resident of Sunset Park. Um, I want to commend all the great work that you've been doing for our public libraries. Thank you. Um, it is a place, uh, it's a second home for me and my two children. Um, they enjoy so much story time there, the different programs offered. Um, I do want to ask, do you see any uh, the priority of yours in the future to continue these programs at the public library to further them um, as it is something that me and my children do enjoy very much? Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, Brooklyn Public Library is doing amazing work. And um, again, this is a big part of my experience as a parent was doing the exact same thing. Uh, my kids spent a lot of time in the library too. Look, what we're doing now we feel great about. Uh, our libraries have been big partners with us, including in our after-school programs that I mentioned. Uh, again, continuing what we got right now, I feel good about. Can we expand? Gets back to the same point. What is going to be this bigger situation with the federal government? What's going to be the impact on our budget? We don't know. We pass our budget coming up in June, so we have some time to sort it all out. But I feel good about continuity. Not sure yet what we can do from there but we're seeing great work being done at the libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we have questions over here, right over here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, since the inception of Learning to Work or LTW programs in New York City, which works with at-risk high school students aged 16 to 21, the dropout rate in New York City has dropped from 22% in 2005 to just 8.5% in 2016. The proposed cuts to YBC providers that are receiving LTW funds are drastic and would impact future student graduation rates. Staff caseloads would double, less paid internships for students who needed to support themselves, and less post-secondary planning and engagements would occur. We understand the goal to expand LTW to more schools, but shouldn't new money be added for this rather than taking funds from schools currently serving students who are at risk? Just let me ask a clarifying question, and our Deputy Chancellor Phil Weinberg from DOE is here too. This is, there was a federal program that cut back, or is this the, the state funding? Which one is this? This is our reallocation of money to go. Oh, okay, so you're, you're familiar with this. Okay. Let's, I'm going to have the Deputy Chancellor answer this. So the, the, as you indicated, we believe in the concept very strongly. Absolutely. And we're keeping stability in the overall amount of money. But let the Deputy Chancellor explain why we're shifting some of the specifics within the program. We have been shifting, we are talking about shifting the funds to meet the student need throughout the city. Much like the first two questions, we'd love to add um, funding there to expand. But we don't know that that's in the cards right now. But right now, we want to make sure the money goes where the bulk of the students are. And so it's a shift between some of the programs. And, that's, and it's based on where the level of the number of people we can serve is the highest. The Deputy Chancellor will happily talk about you. If there, again, if we see something that we need to make an adjustment on, we're very happy to. But right now, the goal is to go where the number of kids, the number of people we can serve is it's the highest. Hey, before we go on, I, I don't, can't see her yet, but I heard she's here. Congress, oh, there she is. Congress member Nydia Velasquez, thank you so much. <laughs> and I want to tell you that, uh, again, uh, it's not a political event, but we are allowed to offer our views, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I want to say in a situation where it's been needed 
It's been necessary, it's been vital to fight the regressive policies of the Trump administration. One of the loudest, strongest members of the Congress has been Nidia Velasquez. So no we one thank better. you. No one better. Our luchadora, thank you for being here tonight, Congresswoman. Uh, we're gonna go to a question over here, uh, right over here. Hi, my name is, oh, thank you. My name is Karen Blondell, and I work with Turning the Tide. Yes. Which is an environmental group in Red Hook and Gowanus. And my question, first of all, I have a list of questions. I did give it to your representative. Good. To be distributed to you. Thank you. My question is in regards to challenges uh, in Red Hook. Uh, we have made many valuable recommendations in regards to resiliency, social cohesion, mole, climate change and environmental challenges like lead in our ball fields and the integrated flood protection system that we won. All right, but give me one thing you want to focus on. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, could public housing residents form a task force in Red Hook in regards to the environmental issues that we face, including the Superfund Gowanus Canal? I'll start and our chair, Shola Alate, will join me. Um, yeah, we want, look, I think it gets right back to how Council Member Menchaca started this meeting. Uh, we think that maximum involvement is a very good thing and there's a lot going on in Red Hook. Over half a billion from FEMA just for Red Hook houses and yes, with the EPA's uh, mandate, what we're doing with the ball fields, there's a whole lot going on. So we want to make sure that residents are one, informed of everything going on and two, obviously, if they see things that we need to address, we want to be a part of it. So, Chair, how can we do that? Very quickly. First, thank you for your question. Um, I will say we have, uh, we would love to engage you in the already ongoing discussions that residents have been a part of uh, in the Sandy restoration and resiliency work. With the help of your council member, we've had hundreds of meetings over the course of the last several years. So there is a, a group of, of residents already doing that. We'd love to include you and or expand that as, as, as appropriate. Okay, thank you. Yep, and, and I just wanna say, and, and give the opportunity for the Congresswoman to, to greet everyone quickly and just say how she, was, she has been uh, at the forefront before I even got involved in, in, in government work and I just wanna thank her publicly and have her say a couple words to us tonight. Thank you, thank you and good evening. Thank you. I just literally made it here from Washington DC and there's nothing better than being at home, being in my house. So let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio and particularly the Sunset Park community, but in Brooklyn, throughout Brooklyn, because you have been collecting bottles of water, food, and as we speak, Dennis Flores from El Grito is right there um, distributing the food that was collected by this great community to help the people in Puerto Rico where the F Trump administration has failed fellow citizens in Puerto Rico. Um, yes, the mayor is right. I just got here and next week we're gonna go back. It has been quite an eventful year in Washington. We must defeat the tax bill That will be so detrimental to the middle class, working families. It will shortchange the future of our city, particularly education. And believe me, if we pass this tax bill, it will explode the deficit by $1.3 trillion, meaning less money for school, less money for healthcare, less money for environmental issues that we are confronting, and yes, we are cleaning up the Gorgoanas Canal. So thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I wanna ask for a question in Spanish, uh, and then we're gonna ask for questions in Chinese as well. So, in Espanol, acá, por favor. The gentleman, uh, no, behind you. Yeah, there you go. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es José López, eh, soy Teamster, 
eh, pertenezco a Things Metal Management Recycling en Brooklyn. Eh, antes de mi pregunta, quiero darle las gracias a ustedes dos eh, particularmente por la gran ayuda que me dio a mí y a todos mis compañeros, permitiendo que nos organizáramos este año y sindicalizarnos. Paso a mi pregunta y es que para nadie es un secreto que allá afuera hay miles de trabajadores en condiciones extrema y muy peligrosa que quieren organizarse y let's, los let's, let's give the chance just for the translator to catch up who's going to do the translation okay. go ahead hey, good evening I'm Jose Lopez I'm a teamster uh, first of all I want to thank you both of you for giving us the chance of uh, unionize and regroup uh, I want to talk about uh, the thousands of workers that are out there in Brooklyn in risky conditions y cuando tratan de organizarse, los patrones, aparte de robarle, lo discriminan. ¿Qué pueden hacer ustedes para que esas familias, a través de esos trabajadores, puedan tener la seguridad de sindicalizarse y tener mejores condiciones laborales? And when they try to organize amongst themselves, uh, their bosses, uh, in, in, in addition to stealing from them, they discriminate against them. What can you do for them to be able to syndicalize together and so that they can offer better, better conditions for their families? Thank you for the question. Look, uh, I'm very supportive of the labor union movement expanding of more and more workers being organized. I think it's our responsibility as elected officials to support organizing efforts. I don't know all the specifics of this situation, but I'm happy to have my administration meet with the workers and see how we can support their struggle and their effort to unionize. Absolutely. And I want to say that the, the Teamsters uh, that success, successfully organized at Sims is an example of how we need to continue to let every worker know that you have the right, no matter what immigration status you have, to organize, to speak out, and seek support. And we're going to do that uh, in this administration, my council office, uh, and the city of New York. So thank you for being here, uh, and thanks for the Teamsters and the work that they do. Uh, now, uh, is there a, a, a question from a Chinese uh, community member? Um, yes, right over here. Oh, I really appreciate that the uh, mayor can choose me to be asking you the question. I really appreciate that we have the chance to talk about that. Uh, we are as identified for the people who is a delivery guide. We're using an electronic bike. We want to ask him the question is, what's happening about the future for next year? So the question is about electronic bicycles. Thank you very much for the question. So um, let me start and then you feel free to jump in. Um, this is an issue and it's a very um, unusual one because the New York State laws say that you can own an electronic bicycle in New York City but you cannot use an electronic bicycle in New York City. So it's a strange reality to begin with. But here's the other reality, and I know a lot of hardworking people, such as are represented here, have the electronic bicycles, have been using them as part of their work, and I do appreciate that it's been important to their livelihood. The problem is, it was actually, and I don't think it's their fault at all, it is, I believe, much more the fault of the businesses, which are primarily restaurants and other service industries, that have employed people to use the electronic bicycles even though it's not legal. And in the meantime, everyone knows how congested our streets and our sidewalks are, and there's been a number of incidents, uh, unfortunately, that have made people feel very unsafe when the electric bikes are being used. So we had a very clear message. Uh, this was about a month or two ago we announced we're going to honor the law very specifically in a way that was not done sufficiently in the past. We're enforcing the law as of next month in January, 
Uh, deliveries by electric bikes will not be allowed. The NYPD will stop them. But the penalties will not be applied to the riders, to the people making the deliveries. The penalties will be applied to the business owners who all these years have been using these bikes illegally. We don't want to see the little guy, the average working person, have to deal with the fines. We do want to see the businesses stop using these electric bikes. They can still use cars, they can still use uh, regular bicycles, there's still ways to make deliveries and to keep people in their employment, but the electric bikes are not legal and are not safe. And the only way they would be made legal is through action in Albany by the state legislature. So in January is when that enforcement effort begins. What I want to add here is, is that this is, a, this is very complicated in so many ways, but it's also an opportunity for us as a community to come together to help shape the future of workers, because right now we're talking about e-bikes, but that enforcement has had negative impacts to our immigrant communities. And I just want to say that that is something that we are seeing that we want to understand more so that we can actually shape the state level changes. Um, I, uh, we are going to monitor that enforcement, and that enforcement has been strong here in the 72nd Precinct and in Brooklyn, um, but I want to make sure that we continue to go back to the workers to make sure that your promises are kept uh, as we move forward, but to work with the businesses and the workers to get to a solution. That is important, and uh, I want to make sure as the chair of the Immigration Committee that I continue to bring the immigrant voice as we move forward. And just to and finish on, I want to thank the council member because we want that. We want that monitoring. Again, one, we want to make sure, and I know NYPD understands this fully, we're going to be putting those fines and that enforcement on the businesses, not the workers. Uh, two, any business that's making a lot of money off deliveries right now, I guarantee you something about the free enterprise system. They're not going to stop making deliveries. If, there's a, if they can make a buck at it, they're going to find a way to do it. So that you're going to get cars, they're going to use regular bicycles, they're going to keep making deliveries, and it's a chance for these workers to still have opportunity. Thank you for that topic of coming out tonight. Okay, so I want to come out here tonight, uh, or here uh, in the back, over here with a hat uh, and the black jacket. Una pregunta en español? Sí. Sí. Mi nombre, bueno, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Policarpo Cortés, yo soy un vendedor ambulante del de proyecto de Street Vendor de, y mis compañeros representando. Yo quisiera hacerle la pregunta a usted, señor con, di, Bill Di Blasio, que, ¿qué está pasando con los permisos de nosotros? Y aquí gracias también al concejal que estamos aquí presentes. Street Vendor. Uh, I got the basics, but go ahead. Good evening, I'm Policarpo Cortez. I, I'm a street vendor. I belong to the group of uh, street vendors. Uh, my question to you is uh, major, is what's going on with our permits? Thank you for the question. So um, street vendors have been uh, very active coming to town hall meetings all over the city, and I appreciate uh, their presence and their activism. Uh, what I've said now for months is that our hope had been to get a piece of legislation done by this month that would address a number of issues. The number of permits, how enforcement would be done going forward, what would be the geographical areas where vendors could go and any restrictions. There's a whole hope and a vision to get these issues resolved by December. Uh, what has happened has not met my goals, to be honest. Uh, the legislation that's been put forward did not reflect some of the things that I asked to be in it. Uh, I don't know if that legislation is going to succeed at this point in the City Council. What I can say is I think there's going to be a fresh opportunity in January. Uh, there will be uh, a new City Council, uh, but one that shares a lot of the values of the current City Council. There will be a new City Council speaker. The administration is ready to get to work on a vendor bill to address these issues. But again, I want to be very consistent to address the concerns of vendors but also of surrounding neighborhoods. And I think we can do that. And I think there's a way to do that that also expands the number of licenses if we can strike the right balance. But at this moment, I think, unfortunately, it's going to take going at least to January to get it done. And the only thing that I want to add, and I'm going to bring one more student uh, for a question, um, is you're going to start hearing a lot more about the vendors that have been on a four-year campaign. The bill that is on the, in the way, on the way, in process, that will be up for a possible vote 
on the 19th of December, which is days away, um, is, is a good bill. And I will continue to talk about that publicly uh, and continue to work with you. If we can't pass it now, uh, which we're, the hope is, and I know we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to negotiate, and this is how laws get made, uh, we will, we, that, that effort will start anew in January. But I do wanna say that vendors in our community and in the city are, uh, are part of the history and the fabric of our incredible community, and it's an opportunity for, for work. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's safe and clean, uh, and those are things that I think we share in values. Uh, with the mayor and the administration and the city council. So don't stop organizing, don't stop uh, using your voice. That is the key thing to say here about e-bikes and street vendors. One more question over here from the kids, uh, from, this, from the youth who are leaving uh, tonight. Over here, yes. Hi, I'm Hannah, I'm in the seventh grade. And here at 88, we have a social emotional teacher along with several guidance counselors to support people who need it. Unfortunately, some kids suffering from depression and anxiety don't have the support they need. What do you plan on doing to help end teen anxiety and depression? Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> it's a great, great question, and I think we have a lot of evidence um, that it's been a very challenging time in history, and that is adding, in fact, to the anxiety levels of a lot of teenagers, and that a whole host of issues that should have been addressed uh, historically, meaning that, that should have been part of how we approach youth and their needs, a lot of times just got ignored. And so we've created an initiative, my, my wife Shirlane has led it, called Thrive NYC, which is about making everything from counseling to mental health support services available widely in the city, uh, in different languages, in different communities. Uh, and it's been also about making sure there's more being done in the schools. That includes peer counseling, that obviously connects to restorative justice programs. There's a whole host of different things. And this school has been a great example. And I've been here to see some of it. Uh, that this school's been one of the leaders in it. So we believe very much in expanding that approach, giving young people more and more opportunities to have places where they can talk with each other and with trained adults. We also, very important for everyone, because this is about young people, but it's about everyone, uh, the Thrive NYC hotline, which is 1-888-NYC-WELL. This is something we never had before in New York City. It's a hotline where there's trained counselors 24-7, multiple languages, who, if you have an anxiety issue, if you're suffering from depression, whatever it happens to be, you can call, you can get someone immediately who's ready to help right away, and also ready to help figure out what people need next. And if they need additional appointments, additional service, they'll literally help you make the appointment and follow up to make sure it's working for you. By the way, same approach God forbid anyone in your life is dealing with an opioid addiction, which is a huge issue now. That same number can be called, you can call it, or anyone, a loved one can call to get help. That's, again, I wanna say it again, it's 888-NYC-WELL, and so that everyone remembers it and it gets right into your brain, I want you to repeat it with me. 888-NYC-WELL. Please pass that number around. So. The answer to your question is all of those different pieces, but we really believe this is an important thing to do that the city has to do because it's a growing challenge in our society. And when people can have access to the places where they can actually talk to someone the right way, it makes a huge difference. Thank you for the question from the young folks. Uh, I know they're not gonna stay too long, um, but we have a question over here from Juana. En español. Buenas noches a todos y al alcalde, al cónsul y a todo el mundo. Good evening, everyone, the uh, mayor, councilman, everybody. Mi pregunta es, yo, 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 mi nombre es Juana Narváez. Llevo viviendo en Red Hook 40 años. Me my name is Ana, and I've been living in Red Hook for 40 years. Me gustaría que la, invitarle al alcalde que visitara Red Hook 
para que chequeara los apartamentos porque los apartamentos están dañados. I would like to invite the mayor to come to Red Hook for him to see, take a look uh, into the apartments because these apartments are in very bad conditions. Tienen mold, tienen asbesto y tienen plomo. Mi apartamento lo tuvieron que, uh, tuve que ir a la corte para que me arreglaran en mi apartamento porque tenía asbesto. These apartments have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of contamination in them, there's lead, and there are other chemicals, including my apartment, and I've been to court trying to get help for that. Muchas gracias por su pregunta en la invitación. Yes, thank uh, you. Thank you for the question. Look, um, I, I am, I've visited Red Hook houses in the past, including in those tough days after Sandy, but even long before that. And I've spent a lot of time uh, with public housing residents, including in their own apartments. I absolutely agree. There are too many uh, buildings where there's huge physical problems that we have to address. We've been very honest, Chair and I, from the beginning, that because for decades and decades, uh, the Housing Authority did not get the investment it deserved, particularly from the federal government. This goes back from 1980 till now. Um, a lot of the buildings have really suffered, and people are suffering as a result. Our job is to consistently address that, but we also have to be very honest with people about what kind of resources we have. So, for example, in the last budget that we did with the City Council, we put $1.3 billion into fixing roofs and fixing the facades of the building, both of which were presenting safety and health problems. Uh, the roofs are the number one cause of the mold when the roofs are leaking. That's how so much of the mold happens, for example. We're going to continue to invest constantly as much as we can. Uh, and we're also working with uh, each building, with the management, with the people who work there, with the residents, to figure out what the priorities are, and what we can fix, and what needs to be fixed first, while continuing to strengthen NYCHA for the long term. When we came in, NYCHA was financially near collapse because of the chair's good work. NYCHA is now in a much stronger place, but it's going to take years to keep fixing all these problems that were ignored, in fact, for decades. So that's our plan for Red Hook Houses and for so many other developments as well. And just to add, if there's something specific in your apartment, ma'am, we'd love to follow up with you. We have staff here who can follow up with you directly to, to uh, check in on those issues that you raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juana. Uh, over here, anyone in the front? Right over here in the corner? Cesar? Good evening. Thank you, Carlos. Good evening, Mayor. You probably don't recognize me because every time we see each other, I'm a, a sweaty mess and we're in uh, workout clothes, but uh, it's good to see you here. You, um, you clean up good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you as well. Um, question, question. Yes, question. So um, my question relates to um, education, specifically early childhood education, and I applaud your efforts for everything you've done with UPK and UPK3, um, but I'm wondering what your thinking is on the zero to three space, okay? I think we're missing a big opportunity, particularly in places like Sunset Park, Central Brooklyn, where we have a lot of underserved people, and the real head start for some of these folks is zero to three. Oftentimes, three and four-year-olds, it's already too late. So what, what's your thinking on that, and what's the city going to do to open up that space? Okay, I want to I agree with you on one piece and disagree on another piece. I agree with you on the central importance of zero to three. Some people would say zero to five, but 100%, this is what animated so much of what we did. As a society, we were missing the most important time to reach children. I don't agree that if you don't get the ideal uh, approach in the first few years, it's quote unquote too late. I think we have that whole zero to five time uh, to make the maximum impact. So we've been basically counting backwards. First, the goal was to say, how are you going to um, address the needs of children if you don't have universal pre-K? To me, this was just an astounding um, misstep in the history of New York City that the thing that would have provided such a strong foundation was missed. We said we're going to right that wrong. We had to create it on a universal level for free. That's been happening. That's been achieved. The next is to do the three-year-olds, to go the next year down. When we started, we thought it was possibly more than could be reached, but we saw the success of the four-year-old level. We realized we could reach the three-year-old level. By September 2021, that will be universal. So then it's zero, one, two. 
And I think the answer is two things. Of course, we're going to try and um, a lot of the organizations are ready to serve younger kids. It won't be in our public schools, but it will be in community-based organizations. We're going to try and continue to keep them strong so they can reach the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. But I think the other thing is at home, so for example, we're trying to teach people, we're literally with our uh, outreach workers, to focus on talking to your baby, singing to your baby, all the stuff that develops vocabulary, literally from the first days of their lives and consistently. That's something I think the city can do a lot more on, helping parents very early on to understand those techniques. But what I'm really excited about is, this used to not be talked about at all, and I really appreciate your question. Early child education was a stepchild. If you talk about issues that people talked about and was on the front pages, it used to be ignored entirely. Now, everyone knows what's happening in New York. Everyone knows this is, the, this is the capital of early child education in the whole country. And again, let's thank all the educators who have been a part of that. Thank you. And there's, Laura, you've got, you've got the, don't you have the biggest pre-K center in the whole city? Yes, hi, my name is Laura Scott and I am the principal of two schools that are near here. And one is a pre-K that has 420 students. And my question is, I was wondering if funds could be set aside for playgrounds for those children. We have a playground nearby, but it can only accommodate 36 kids at a time. So I was wondering if you could put money aside for schools such as mine to have a school playground that is barrier free. All right, now, first of all, I appreciate the question. Second of all, there is no other school like yours. Yours is the biggest. The pre-K palace, I call it. So, uh, I, you know, I think the world of you and your work, and that's one of the, the most uh, renowned pre-K centers in the entire city. So we're gonna see if we can help you. I can't commit until I know a little bit more, but I would love to get it done for you. So we will follow up. Melanie from the School Construction Authority will see you right after. and Let's see if we might be able to help you with some additional playground capacity. Awesome, and I'll be there along the way as well. Okay, um, over here on this court. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Hennessy Aquino. I have a question uh, for the mayor and maybe a charade. Um, I want to know what is being done to implement the right to counsel for NYSHA tenants, because I see a lot of confusion in housing court, and tenants feel um, left out of the right to counsel. Also, I heard that there was going to be something implemented at 250 Broadway, and I have seen nothing yet. So I want to know what is going to be done uh, to include NYSHA tenants. Yep, in and the it's right a great counsel. question. Also, and wait, wait, one, one per person, that's a question, but okay. it's a great one, one question. question. It's a good question. And I'm gonna to turn to Commissioner Steve Banks, Commissioner of Social Services, but the answer is yes. It does reach NYCHA tenants. Remember, right to counsel just got passed months ago. It's being ramped up now, but we do believe we should be held to the same standard uh, in terms of the city of New York. So, Commissioner. Uh, just very quickly, in housing court right now, we are providing representation. We are working on how to roll that out in administrative proceedings as well. But the most important thing to remember with the right to counsel, access to counsel, it's a five-year implementation process. And we've been bringing on zip codes each year. And so we can't reach the whole city at once. We're phasing it in. Part of it is having enough lawyers who can be hired and trained by the providers but as the mayor said, I just want to put, put a, 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 you, that thought to rest. NYCHA tenants right now are being represented in housing court and working on how to roll that out in administrative proceedings. Thank you for that. And that's going to be something that we're going to want to make sure uh, we follow up on, especially for NYCHA. Uh, uh, right over here in the back with the man in the coat. Hello, Mr. Mayor. I have a very short question for you. A lot of parents so worried about New York City's specialized high school exam. They still are talking about that. They worry about this exam will be canceled or replaced by other methods. If you want to change it, we would like to hear how you would like to change it. Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Okay. This issue, I really appreciate the question because it's an issue that this city needs to come to grips with. Specialized schools like Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Tech, Bronx Science, these are some of the very best schools, not only in this city, but anywhere. 
Uh, the only way you get into them by the current state law is you take a single test, and that's the, literally the only admissions uh, ability is through one test. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in it. Uh, I think, first of all, I do not believe in ever using high stakes testing alone to make a decision of that magnitude that's going to change the entire future of a child. Some kids test really well, some kids are brilliant and don't test well. That doesn't make them any less brilliant. And I always say, when you think about the universities in this country, the most renowned universities don't do their admissions by a single test. They look at grades, they look at extracurricular activities and essays and interviews and everything. So the system I would like to create is that kind of model, where you take a bunch of different, you take a number of different elements and those are considered in the admission. That can only happen with state law. The city does not make that decision. The state legislature makes that decision. I am asking the state legislature to change. Honestly, they've not been willing to do it. So do I think it's going to change right away? No. Do I think it could change in the next few years? Yes. The final thing I want to say, this city, unlike the vast majority of cities, we have every kind of people represented here. Our communities of all different backgrounds are strong. We have a large Asian community, uh, Latino community, African American community, white community. We have the whole spectrum. We don't have any one dominant community in New York City. We're made up of all people. But if you look at Stuyvesant High School, the last time I checked, it was only 7% black and Latino. This city's over, well over 50% black and Latino, but Stuyvesant High School was less than 7%. That's not representative. That's not fair. That's one example of why we have to change it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and we have on this section uh, are the, a youth in the back who's still here at 9, what is it, 20? Go ahead. Ask your question. Hi, my name is Nathan Feldman. I'm an eighth grader at MS88, and I help out with the o uh, Billion Oyster Project. I think it's really cool to do hands-on research with live creatures. And uh, my question is, is uh, are you gonna continue to support the Billion Oyster Project and other science-related projects that support a clean environment? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes. Nathan, the answer is yes. Keep getting those oysters out there, okay? Because we love it. Thank you for everything you're doing. Awesome, thank you. And I will say that we are in the process of citing a middle school in Red Hook uh, that will take on the Harbor School and be a feeder for so many elementary school students here in the district that will get to work on projects like that. Thank you. We're going to go to this uh, area here, uh, right in front. Hi, another waterfront question from the nonprofit Portside New York. I'm Carlina Salguero. So Portside knows from our advocacy in our 12-year search for a home that New York City is not hospitable to maritime activity. So can you promise the following? That the new Dock NYC contract that runs so many city piers will oblige the operator to provide community programs and public access maritime so that Sunset Park finally gets programming on the 58th Street Pier, Red Hook gets it in Atlantic Basin, and we don't lose a space for our ship, the Mary A. Whalen. Your current operator told us this year, I'm not running a charity. Okay, you are, you're a little bit above my knowledge base, but that's the, president, the, guy. the president of the Economic Development and Corporation, SBS, James SBS. Patchett, will, we're not going back and forth here, you raised your concern. James Patchett, what do you got to say? Hi, Carolina, nice to see you again. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we spend a lot of time together, it's good to see you always. So. Uh, you know, we're absolutely committed to ensuring public access to our waterfronts. I, you know, I had an opportunity to, stay, uh, to sit with you on uh, the Mary Whalen a few weeks ago with the council member and talk about the issues and trying to find your organization a permanent home. Uh, we're, we're, we're working. Congress has spoken. <laughs> we're, we're working on it. We have a good plan. Um, so absolutely, we're committed to public access. We're committed to ensuring that Doc NYC is inclusive of community needs, provides support, and also uh, public investment, including across Sunset Park and Red Hook, which means access for local fishermen who've been using the piers for years, waterfront access, new plazas, everything. I'd love to talk more about the specific issues you raised tonight. 
Yeah, well, okay. He will follow up. We'll Obviously, follow up he's paying. A, he's a very yeah. senior member of the team, and he's paying attention, and he's been on your Thank boat. you. So, ship. Thank you for that. We're going to go to this this uh, section here today, right here in the front. Good evening. My name is Monica Sibri, and I am one of the. 6,000 undocumented students that actually graduated from CUNY as a dreamer, undocumented. Ooh. But I only made it because while you were a public advocate, you created a program called the Dream Fellowship for undocumented students to partially pay their tuition and give them professional development. As a mayor, I am a little bit disappointed that the program has not continued to be part of the only program that was available for undocumented students at CUNY and in New York City. So my question to you tonight is, will you commit to develop or create the program and bring it back to help undocumented students, which is the only program that we know has been open for undocumented and DACA students? Thank you, Thank you for much. that question. Now Okay, so we need to find the resources to make that happen, and it is, you're right, it's a very good idea, it worked previously. Uh, honestly, a lot of our attention in the last year went into legal services to protect folks who were being potentially deported, and the council made that a very high priority, and we put substantial amount of resources in that. So I do think our attention's been on another piece of the challenge, but I think you're right that the fellowship was a great program and worked really well. So we are going to go out and try and put together the resources to continue that effort. I will, we will give you a report back. Bida Mustafi is running our uh, office, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. She will follow up with you on the next steps and what we can do. Absolutely, Monica and I speak often. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that question and that commitment to education. Okay, um, we want to go here in the, f uh, the front f first, and then we're going to go to the back. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for continuing the dialogue with the community. Everybody Closer. appreciates it. Thank you. Uh, ben Margolis with SBIDC, the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Question on jobs. Uh, the city partners with us, as it does with many organizations, to uh, manage and support and invest in the industrial business zone. In our case, it's the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. Can we get a commitment from the administration uh, to make, to really to study and understand and make uh, priority investments in the IBZ in order to create not just quality jobs, but quality careers for local residents, uh, especially in a district like this. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just as I'll let James get into detail, but the basic answer is I, I believe that's what we're doing and, and obviously there's something we have to fine tune, we will. The whole goal, we have the 100,000 job plan, the focus is, and, and this was a standard we set, we wanted to see jobs where people would be at 50,000 either immediately or soon into their work and then would sustain at that level or higher, heavy focus on industrial and manufacturing jobs. Um, we believe there's a lot of places, and what you're doing is a great example, that can support many more such jobs and we believe there's a growing need and a growing market. So. I think we're, we're pretty aligned, but in terms of the specifics, James. Sure, so it's good to see you. Um, um, fortunate, we're very fortunate in Sunset Park uh, to have wonderful support from our task force, which is led by the council member and your organization to talk about these issues on a regular basis. Um, we are, as you know, we are absolutely committed to investing in this area. The city under the mayor's leadership with the council member's support has invested over $300 million between Brooklyn Army Terminal and Bush Terminal to try and meaningfully advance the amount of jobs. That is brought us up to almost 5,000 jobs in the city assets um, in the IBZ. We also want to be supporting... Can you tell everybody what the IBZ is really quick? Oh, industrial business zone, which is the industrial area of the city um, that is designated specifically for industrial use. So <clears throat> in addition to that, the, um, we, have, um, we have many programs available specifically to provide uh, 
tax incentives and other programs for, for private businesses to advance industrial jobs, businesses that are providing good quality jobs and pathways for New Yorkers, especially local jobs. So we'd love to continue to work with you to continue to invest and to support private businesses as well as getting more businesses with good jobs into city assets. So can I just, t one, I'm gonna just follow your question for you. Just in terms of uh, focusing activity in IBZs, promoting IBZs, maximizing IBZs, any way you want to say it. Just I, I want a little bit sharper answer so everyone understands. Let's give an example, a specific of something we're doing along those lines. Uh, well, this, this, is, this IBZ is of near and dear to my heart because it, as it happens, we, EDC and the city, have six million square feet of space. We are primarily investing in those assets to get good jobs directly into the city assets so that we have thousands of people working in jobs that pay good wages directly in city assets. It's, we have the ability to provide long-term leases to people with affordable rents, which allows them to support their workers and businesses for the long term. Outside of our walls, we're also investing in the streets to make it easier for trucks to move around in sewer issues to address long, long time concerns of the neighborhood and address a lot of the other infrastructure to support all of the businesses' needs. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, in the back, Ryan. Mr. Mayor, two years ago, you released a 10-point plan to protect our industrial and manufacturing jobs. Today, Sunset Park is facing a dramatic de-industrialization proposal, the rezoning of Industry City. Can the community count on you to oppose this plan to commercialize the largest private manufacturing property that we have? Thank you. So like a lot of people in the community, um, I want to see what this plan is about and I want to see what the impact will be on exactly that, on long-term, good-paying industrial jobs. I have not seen the plan personally. I have certainly not approved the plan. As you know, there's a whole process ahead. And one of the biggest factors for me in terms of weighing in will be, does it create those kind of jobs? I want to be very blunt with everyone. Um, we understand there's a lot of jobs in this city that, for example, retail, service sector, a lot of people have those jobs. I'm sure people in this room have those jobs. They are a needed part of the economy, and, and if people get a service job and it's only a minimum wage job, that's still important. We still value that. But what we aspire to, what we are trying to make the norm more and more, is a higher paying working class job, those industrial manufacturing jobs, the areas I mentioned, like uh, film and TV, like garment manufacturing, many others. So when we assess this proposal for Industry City, that's gonna to be to me one of the most central things. Does it create those kind of jobs in sufficient numbers? That to me is what I'm looking for, and it's simple, and by the way, anywhere in the city. Job creation that's quality jobs, better paying jobs, is one of my number one imperatives, and the creation of affordable housing. That's why I look at any proposal, but I haven't seen this one yet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, we want to go on this side here, uh, we're here in the front. This is going to be a question in Spanish. Mi nombre es Rafael, soy miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral. Mi nombre es Rafael, and I'm member of, ¿cómo se llama? Miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral. And I am a member of the uh, Project Justice and uh, Labor and Families. Mi pregunta es, ¿por qué si... Si, si somos una ciudad santuaria, ¿por qué hay gente de inmigración en las cortes? Why, why, why is it that if we are a sanctuary city, why is it that we still have people from immigration in, inside the courthouses? Y también muchos padres de familia como yo estamos a riesgo de ser reportados. ¿Por qué? And why is it that a lot of fathers and, and parents like myself are at risk of being deported? Why? Okay, thank you. Su, su administración está permitiendo que gente de inmigración estén en esta ciudad. Your, your administration is allowing these people from immigration to be here in this city. Algunos okay. Padres okay, muchas gracias por esa pregunta. Eh, eh, en total, okay. entendemos que, que tenemos que, que hacer okay. como una ciudad. 
uh, de nada. But listen, <laughs> that last statement respectfully is not accurate. Uh, and I want to describe what we're trying to do. It's not a question of whether New York City allows ICE to operate in New York City. New York City is part of the United States of America. ICE is allowed to be on our streets because we have no choice under federal law. But where we do have a choice is in city buildings and city property, and our message is we do not allow ICE into city schools. We do not allow ICE into city hospitals. We've been very clear. Uh, the NYPD does not ask documentation status of New Yorkers, nor do our hospitals or any other of our city facilities. The city's been very, very clear and consistent about this. Why is ICE in the courts? I think it's a mistake that ICE is in courts. We do not run the courts. The state of New York runs the courts. I think the state of New York should end the practice of allowing ICE to come into the court buildings because it doesn't, it's not fair. It's not fair and it discourages people from participating in the criminal justice system. If someone is trying to participate and it might lead to their own deportation, no one's gonna participate anymore. And this is why, again, the NYPD decades ago came to the conclusion that they should never ask documentation status because it would make everyone less safe if witnesses to crime or victims of crime could not come forward for fear of deportation. The last thing I wanna say, and I wanna thank the council member because he's the head of the immigration committee and he's been very focused on this. The city of New York made a commitment that if New Yorkers are facing deportation, that we will provide legal support to help stop the deportation, to stop families from being torn apart. That's a very high level of commitment by a city to address a mistake by our federal government, and we're very committed to that policy. Thank you for that support and, and the, all the work at the mayor, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, can we get a question over here? Uh, in black jacket. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. de Blasio. My name is Sharon Page. I live in Red Hook East Houses. I want to know why did it take so long for y'all to come out and tell us about the field inspections with the lead? Because Thank not you. for nothing, my son was affected by that. Thank, Thank you, you very much for, that for the question. question. Look, I've been very straightforward about this. This was not handled right. I'm not going to tell you anything but that. It wasn't handled right. Um, when we came into this administration in 2014, the inspections had already been stopped under the previous administration. Bluntly, our team came in and did not realize that the inspections were not being done. Um, that was a mistake. When we recognized the inspections were not being done, we restarted them, we told residents the inspections were now coming, they have been done, they're being done again, and they will be done constantly from this point on. Every apartment uh, that might have led that has a child under six, you're gonna see those inspections every year. Any condition that has to be addressed, we will spend the money to fix it. A lot of times that's repainting or whatever it is. That's what I'm telling you is what's happening now and will happen every year from this point. Any child that needs our medical help can get it. We're right now, our health commissioner is here. But listen, our health commissioner is right there, Dr. Mary Bassett. She will see you right now to make sure you get whatever you need. But we're going to provide the health care directly to any families that need it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for that, for that answer and that commitment, uh, not only for the Department of, of Health, um, but also um, from NYCHA as well. Uh, question here in the front. It's an honor, Your Honor. How are you? Uh, in the middle of Sunset Park, there is a beautiful landmark courthouse. Uh, that is used by the community board for their offices as a community meeting room. And starting next March, it will be the temporary uh, location for the Sunset Park branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. As, as the Brooklyn Public Library's main branch, its uh, current branch builds uh, 60 units of uh, completely affordable housing, I should say. Um, can you make a commitment to keep that space, which is currently run by the NYPD for various back office purposes, as a multi-purpose community space, which has 48,000 square feet, mostly unused uh, for and into perpetuity, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks for the Thank question. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. So look, um, 
again, when I have a town hall meeting, I try to be very clear. If there's something I can commit to, if there's something I'm not ready to commit to, I'll try and be very straightforward about it. This is one I can't commit to at this moment, I'll tell you why. First, of course, as you said, the library needs the space in the short term. Second, we have to first understand what NYPD needs for the long term. And that's very important because they have had that historical role in the space. We'll assess that when, as we get to the time uh, that the library is going to be departing, we'll certainly be assessing what the options are. So I hear you that it's a community concern, can't commit it to it yet, but I do commit to staying in touch with the councilman and the community to figure out how we're going to address the issue. And we're going to continue to organize on that question. Uh, can we do a qu question back here in the corner? Uh, good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Carlos, uh, I'm a mother of a child with autism, and it's very sad to me that uh, my daughter speaks Spanish, and we are, uh, abuela speaks Spanish, Titi speaks Spanish, and we have to face a lot of discrimination. In Sunset Park, uh, we don't have a dual ICT NEST program, and there's just one NEST program f for 25 kids in the whole city. So I have reached out several times to the Department of Education and to the Brooklyn North to open uh, you know, more NEST programs for children with autism to avoid this discrimination. And unfortunately, the doors has been shut and I haven't received any, any answer. Thank you for that question. So this is an area where we open it, but it's not yes. and I'm happy okay. there's a lot of support so, for that, by the way. So, okay. I'm going to give you a um, two-part answer. The first part you won't necessarily like, but it's the truth. We don't do the programs generally on a bilingual basis, and just so you understand how we have organized the NEST programs. They've been incredibly successful. Our parents have been really appreciative of them, but we, we have not oriented them to being bilingual as well. The good news is we intend to keep expanding them. This has been an area where that has worked, it is growing all over the city. The demand is very high. We're going to keep, it's a working model. We're going to keep expanding it. So you will be seeing more and more NEST programs all around the city. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, over here, uh, right here. Yes. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here. I am a lifelong resident of Sunset Park, born and raised up the block from the center that he's talking about, and I work in Industry City. It's the best job that I have. What do you do there? I am the manager of a transportation company, and we work with the ADA community and the greater Medicaid community and helping break down barriers so that those who can't afford transportation or it's too difficult, they're able to get to their doctor's appointment. Before you go on, is it, I'm not gonna ask your salary, but do you regard it as a good paying job? Very good. I like that. Okay, keep going. I'm also here with my partner, who's very good too. Okay. With that being said, transportation is incredibly difficult in this city, and we see those barriers every single day. Yeah. I wanted to know what happened to that light rail, because Industry City is right there on Third Avenue, and that would make things a little bit easier to get around. All right. Thank you. All right, everybody. <laughs> I appreciate the question. Everyone, look, um, I'm the person who proposed that we do the BQX. Other, it's been stereotyped, in my opinion, I respect any critique and any concern, but I just want to give my own views directly, not through a filter. Allow me to finish my statement, then you can get a chance to ask your question or raise your concern. Not through anybody else's prism, because people, I think, honestly have said, oh, this is somebody else trying to do this. No, I proposed it. I said, I want the most transportation options I can get in this city. NYC Ferry that I just talked about started in the last two years out of scratch. It did not exist. There was no such thing. We created a whole new approach where there's going to be ferry service now. You already have it in a lot of places. It's going to keep growing around the city. We need that. It's already instantly filled up. We need more and more. The subways are totally overcrowded. Everyone knows that. We need more select bus service. We just announced 21 new select bus service lines. We're expanding uh, city bike and bike sharing all over the city. We need all of this. The city is growing constantly. We're going to be 9 million people soon. 
So I think light rail, which you see all over the country, all over the world, expansion of light rail. Go and look at cities all over the country. Light rail can be added to communities. New subway lines effectively can't. Look how long the Second Avenue subway took. It took decades and decades to add a small amount more. If we're going to add more transportation, light rail is a part of it, in my opinion. And I think, given the number of jobs being created, that this is a smart place to do it, and it's going to connect a lot of public housing residents. The BQX has about 40,000 public housing res residents along that line, for example. So the plan is moving forward. We, we need, we've been seeking political uh, fr comment from the community. I'm finishing. I'm finishing. We have been seeking comments from the community. We know there's concerns. There's a lot of issues we're going to address. But I've been in other meetings where people are demanding the BQX from public housing and from other communities all over the city, and we're going to keep moving it forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And what I'll say, um, and, and the applause here is to keep making your voices heard on any and all issues that were brought up tonight. Uh, we'll have uh, the young person over here. You, yes. <laughs> Good evening, thank you. My name is Christine and I'm a proud P53K District 75 special needs parent. My question to you, Mayor, is what specific financial and legislative measures do you plan in the next four years to ensure that our students without voices and disabilities receive the appropriate space, placement, programs and services they deserve through the public school system in avoiding outsourcing privately funded pu public schools. Because to be honest and respectful, we've come a long way since Willowbrook, but I'm not necessarily happy with the biggest crumb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So look, I, the underlying reality, which I think you refer to, I have to affirm, which is um, if you're a parent of a child with special needs, you faced a host of challenges, the child faced a host of challenges, and historically, the school system was not friendly or helpful to parents who are already dealing with enough challenges. The first part of that, it's not, it's not like a flip the switch and solve all the problems. The first step was to change the approach in the Department of Education to stop focusing on litigation and making parents have to fight in court for that which had already been agreed to. Um, that's, we're, still, we're still changing that, but what we have done the last two years especially is greatly reduce the amount of litigation, greatly increase the amount of agreement, and um, had parents get agreement on the follow-through on their IEP quicker, more easily. It, for example, a parent who had a situation where the, the child's IEP and, and the specific placement didn't change much over years, rather than going and restarting it every year, we've tried to smooth that out, make that more consistent. The next question is what you raise is a really great one. Well, should we, rather than having to go send kids to all these private schools, should we do it ourselves? I think the answer is we're trying when it comes, for example, uh, to kids on the autism spectrum, that's those NEST programs, that's an area where we have been doing ourselves and having a very good impact because it's something we've been able to do effectively. The demand is huge. That's been a success story. I think I'm a not exactly an expert, and Phil is somewhere behind me, will tell me if there's something to add. I think there are some areas of need that the public school system probably would not be able to master anytime soon, where those private schools are going to be needed. But my answer to you is, if you ask the question, should we do more of it ourselves? The NEST programs are an example of where we already have made that commitment. We're already going to, we've crossed the Rubicon. The answer is yes. I think there's some other areas where it'd probably be a lot harder for us to build the expertise. And then there's just the pure cost level. If you're going to build something up from the beginning, that's a lot of initial investment. Some cases I think we can do it, some cases we can't. Tell me what I missed. No, you didn't miss anything. We're, it, we've changed the approach, as the mayor described. We, it's not going to be perfect. There are tons and tons of obstacles, but we are committed to making it better, easier for families, and making better options for students available. In this but can I have the Deputy Chancellor see you after? Because if there's a specific idea, I mean, once upon a time there were no NEST programs, people started agitating for them, that idea worked. If you have a specific idea of something we should pursue that might be within our reach, we'd like to pursue that with you. Okay? Thank you. Uh, and if we, right here in the front, please. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I have heard you talking about um, Higher. E you education. Um, the, and on edu my question is on education, actually. Um, I have a 16-year-old who is struggling in high school, and I, have, I heard you have great programs for uh, pre-K and, and uh, middle school, but what about our high school kids that are in risk of not graduating from school? Um, do you have any uh, plans for those uh, children that are about to graduate from school and they cannot struggle with the schoolwork because um, there's no resources for them to continue um, their education to graduate. Thank you for the question very much. So um, let me start and then turn to the Deputy Chancellor. Look, um, I can say there's something very good happening in general because we have the highest graduation rate in the history of the city, we have the lowest dropout rate, uh, we have the highest level of college readiness. Something good is happening in general. But there's still a lot of kids, I agree with you, who need more help than they're getting. Uh, in some schools, we've been able to add a lot more uh, guidance counseling. In some schools, we've been able to add more uh, academic enrichment. It really depends on the individual situation. Uh, Phil, w speak to, um, just in general, what we're trying to do to help kids who might not be on track to graduate. And then I'd also like the Deputy Chancellor to follow up with you to make sure, because he can follow up with your child's school, to make sure that we're doing everything we can for your child as well. Adding resources where we can. It's never, a, uh, it's never possible to do everything we want. You are identifying a real problem. We, the graduation rate is higher than it has ever been. This, the graduation rate for students with special needs is also higher, but it hasn't grown fast enough, and we agree with you. We are trying to make sure that we are trying to make sure that our efforts in our classrooms make, reach all of our students, every single one. We're not looking to make sure we, we target a specific group of students, and every one of our students matters to us. I'd like to talk to you more before, before we're done tonight. Thanks. Thank you, don't, so don't leave tonight without talking to the Deputy Chancellor. Uh, in the middle over here, with a hat. Good evening, Mayor. Um, I have a nephew that attends the uh, Harbor School on Governor's Island, but unfortunately he has to take a bus, a train, and a ferry to get there. Um, we don't have five-day service for him, um, but this summer, um, almost like probably the last three weeks of, before school ended, he, hit, he got hit by a car riding oh my God. back from, um, from the train station. Is he okay now? He's okay now, okay. but he was out for almost a week. Um, but thank you for visiting Zero because the police were there in no time. Excellent. Um, but how can we get five days very serious for these students who go to the Harbor School on Governor's Island? Okay, good question. All right, this is, I'm looking at Department of Education, I'm looking at EDC, it runs the ferries because I don't know the answer to that question. What is, do we know what the current situation is with the kids going to the Harbor School? Yes, you do. I Phil, mean, the, Phil? The ferry runs on school schedule, um, so I'm not sure when he wouldn't have a ferry to school. There's no other way to get to the school. I, I just want to, uh, 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 I'm not going to step in too much, but I will say that he's asking about Red Hook connection. Oh, the directly ferry from Red Hook? From Red Hook, uh, Atlantic Basin, to Governor's Island yeah. for school. So the only, the transportation to the school right now is from Lower Manhattan. And I hear you. Um, I don't know if we can... We okay, have so to let me ask investigate. a question. I think that's, it's, it's a tough one. Remember, this is a, it's a little more than running a school bus here, so this is a little bit bigger deal. How many kids go to the school? How many kids go to the harbor? Roughly? I think around, around 500. 500, and let's find out how many are from Brooklyn, how many from Manhattan, et cetera. It's a new one on me. Uh, I think it's, it's a tough one, honestly, to run a boat just for a small group of kids, just for a, a brief period, but we will take a look at it. Can't hurt to look. Uh, and it really depends on where the kids are coming from, and maybe we can find a creative solution. Deputy Chancellor, will you follow up directly? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. And um, remember, the Harbor School is in process right now. Uh, and one of the great things is that we can actually start anticipating that need and that feeder, uh, uh, the, the kind of feeder transportation need on that. Okay, on this side, right here in the front, uh, uh, right next to you. Thank you. Hello, um, my question and comment actually for the mayor. Um, I'll wait for you now. 
Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Noelle. I'm a longtime resident of Sunset Park. And I'm here because I'm, it, com police community relations have radically improved in our neighborhood thanks to Inspector Deputy Emmanuel Gonzalez and his willingness to work with community watchdog groups such as El Grito de Sunset Park. We're talking about historically polar opposites of the spectrum. So we wanna see more of this. We wanna see people like Emmanuel Gonzalez promoted. We wanna see in the top brass, the kind of community leadership, the kind of bridge building that we've seen in his work. And I am hoping that you can make this commitment tonight to let's see this change. Let's allow folks to grow and let's see more Latino, black, and officers of color rise in the ranks and, 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 and uh, improve these community relations. Thank you very, right. very much. The, well, I want to thank you and I want to thank everyone at El Grito and the other organizations that have been fighting for a fairer relationship. And I think that advocacy has had a big impact. Um, I want to say that the inspector is with the colleagues sitting around him. They're, in my opinion, part of a new breed uh, that has been systematically uh, brought up through the ranks. And I want to say, I'll state the obvious. Uh, what I look for, and I know our commissioner looks for, is people who believe in their heart in the neighborhood policing philosophy and believe the only way to effectively police is with that deep partnership and communication with the community. Um, I believe, and you can see it in my administration, I believe in a government that looks like New York City. I believe in a police department that looks like New York City, the rank and file, and up through the leadership ranks. I would also say uh, that some of the strongest believers in the neighborhood policing approach are people like Commissioner O'Neill, who have, he's been there almost 35 years, but philosophically is a deep, deep believer and is constantly looking to support young up-and-coming leaders who share that view. So I, I think we're really well aligned, and I think you'll see with every passing year more and more of such leaders emerging. Thank you. And I just want to underscore the promotion of our Latino uh, uh, not only uh, inspectors, but across the board, bringing more captains up. And, and uh, I also want to applaud the work that um, uh, Inspector Gonzalez is doing. Okay, let's go on this side here, uh, right here, in the, or actually right here in the front. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, number one, for signing the public uh, mandatory lactation room bill. Yes. That's really important for the whole city. Thank you for uh, signing the bill to repeal the racist and homophobic cabaret law yes. that has been on the books for 91 years. Uh, it only took 91 years. <laughs> <laughs> you give us 91 years, we'll fix it. <laughs> uh, I live in Red Hook, lived there for 10 years. My name's Kiki. The BQX is part of a bigger conversation about what's happening in Red Hook. I want to know, is Red Hook going to be rezoned? Uh, your legislation for getting the right to counsel saved my apartment, my rent-stabilized apartment. My landlord still harasses me. Mm. This is something that we're all worried about because with the BQX, where's it going to go? Where are you putting this thing? Mm. We already have tight streets, and they our houses shake from buses going by, right? So... There's that part of it. The second part. So let's is, let's let's. Well, where's our crosstown bus? Just bring back that Union Street bus. Why yeah. can't we just improve and, the infrastructure great, of the buses that's already there instead of putting in this BQX that will only service? Come on, who's supporting it? Two Trees, Tishman Spires, Red Hook Initiative, Jet you, Blue. Okay, thank you. I got your so, point. Those so, are not red. I want to speak to it. I'm going to speak to it. I just want to say it all. Thank That's you. all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you. So for first, on the question of the harassment that you're receiving from your landlord, we need to address that because. We have the council again now. But are they succeeding in getting the landlord to back off? We have my house tomorrow at six o'clock to meet with our tenants. Okay, because just very. Excellent. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk now. So the, I want to make sure just if at any point you don't feel that succeeding, we need to know so we can come in and reinforce because we do not want to let any landlord harassment continue. Because it, It's not only for you, it's to prove everywhere to landlords they can't get away with it. On the question, look, so the developers who believe in a vision is not necessarily what's motivating me or the same vision. My view, and you look at the whole route of the BQX, 
is it is about maximizing mass transit options. This is a place in the city where we can do it. There's a huge number of people. It's 400,000 people and about 100,000 jobs along that route. And many of the areas are underserved by mass transit. These are just facts. Now, I understand, wait, wait, we're not doing back and forth. You got your point, I'm responding to your point. Okay, look, 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 look. Here's how a town hall meeting works. You got your point in, I'm gonna answer. It's the only way it works. So. Of course I understand the gentrification pressure. So you also asked in the beginning, is there gonna be rezoning? So I got no plan for rezoning. I don't want a rezoning. I know this community very well. I want a lot more industrial jobs. I want a lot more manufacturing jobs. I want jobs that'll be really good. In fact, a lot of those jobs that have been created have been, the people in this community have gotten those jobs and are able to continue living in this community because they're getting a better level of pay. That's what we're trying to do. I still believe, I can keep two thoughts in mind at the same time, that more mass transit options is a good thing for everyone. So this whole thing that developers like it, therefore it must be awful, I don't accept that. A developer can like something for their reasons, it's not my reasons. My reasons is I believe in more mass transit options. If we can do it here, we've said this from day one, I said this, if it works along the BQX line, sunset up to Astoria, it gives us the model that then is how we decide if we can do light rail in a lot of other parts of the city, including parts that are fundamentally underserved by mass transit, and that will never see a new subway line, but they could see a new light rail line. That's why we're doing it. Thank you for your, for your question and the comment. Right over here. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. It's in reference to te tenant and landlord issues as well. It's a very dangerous one. Um, these are bills that were sponsored by you, actually, Mr. Carlos Menchaca, thank you, because that really, really is gonna make an impact in my life personally. In regards to the stand for tenant safety uh, bills and laws that were actually passed and signed, thank you, Mr. Mayor de Blasio, for doing that. Um, my question is, how soon will all this be implemented Will the Department of Buildings will be actually initiating these bills? Uh, because I personally am affected by it because I have a landlord who's continuing to use these methods of construction and illegal construction without permits, um, stop work orders on the property, and it just keeps going on and on and on. And we're proactive, but he just totally violates every single law regarding so I'm hoping that these bills will be implemented ASAP. <laughs> so as the commissioner jumps in, yes, uh, I mean, you'll, uh, you'll tell the exact date, because I don't remember the exact implementation date, but it must be pretty immediate. Um, it's one part of the enforcement of the agencies, and also those legal services count across the board. So in your building's case, do you have that legal support? Yeah, we've been actually very proactive working with a community um, organization, Neighbor Helping Neighbors, and with uh, legal services. Okay. Because um, of a, a huge building-wide gas leak that he continued to violate. Okay, but you have legal, ongoing legal support. Y yeah, okay. but you know what? He continues to violate any- But that's, I just wanna make sure you had that to begin, and now Department of Buildings. Sure, um, the, the various bills have different dates so they kick Higher up, higher up. Uh, the various bills have different um, dates that they kick in. Um, however, if you have an unsafe condition at your building, I, please tell me the address and, and we'll get somebody out there to take care of it right He'll away. come see you at the end. So we're going to send building inspectors out right away. And that, you're saying, even before the law, if, if any element of law hasn't taken effect, just an unsafe condition is an unsafe condition. We can act on it right away. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that commitment, and Neighbors Helping Neighbors will help with my office to make sure that, that connection happens. Uh, in the back over here, uh, uh, late woman, lady. So the city has a very ambitious 80 by 50 uh, climate agenda, so that's an 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, what is your administration doing to position our industrial areas as a place to specifically manufacture for climate adaptation and resiliency? I'm gonna need a little help, but I don't know if one of my experts is here. Right here. Uh, one of my experts is here. Okay, so I'll preface and then over to Janie. The 80 by 50 goal, we are adamant about. Uh, in fact, we have asked our agencies to start increasing the speed with which they implement it because when our federal government backed away from the Paris Agreement, 
We felt we should speed up and intensify our efforts. And as you know, over 300 American cities are redoubling their efforts. So we're very excited about that. A lot of what we're doing is, for example, requiring buildings to retrofit. Uh, we're, we're intensifying our efforts to support electric vehicles. I mean, there's a whole host of things. Your question is about industrial and manufacturing areas. Go ahead, Janie. So we've been working with our partners at the Department of City Planning to make sure that we're uh, adapting our industrial areas so that they're safe um, and that they're uh, 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 safe and, and, and managing the risk from climate change hazards. But I think your question is also about the opportunities of adaptive technologies, and that's something we're very interested in and will be part of the next phase of the work that we do. Okay. So will you follow up with her on the idea? I assume you have some good ideas for us, right? Okay. Janie's going to follow up with you directly. Thank you for that. Uh, right here in the front. Hi, my name is Cynthia Campos. Um, I'm here with the campaign Make Space for um, Schools in Sunset Park. I'm a parent myself. Um, schools in Sunset Park are overcrowded, some reaching 156% of their capacity. Even after the new schools are built, children in existing elementary schools will complete their primary um, education in an overcrowded school. My question is, what is your administration going to do to ensure that the children in existing schools in Sunset Park receive the quality education that they need to be able to have a fair opportunity in the future? And the second one is, what is your administration going to do to assure that the new schools are quality schools and respond to the needs of our children? Okay, well, there's certainly going to be public schools. That's no question about that. And they're being built specifically for this community. So, Melanie, tell us what's being built coming up. Sure. So we have nearly 3,000 seats just in this councilmatic district that are in progress. Um, and that is the majority in Sunset Park. So we've had a very good relationship with your group. And I want to thank uh, the council member for his exceptionally strong support of the work we do. We are out literally every day looking for more sites. So while we're very proud of having nearly 3,000 new seats coming online in this district, we're not done. And the administration has given us more funding for seats in these neighborhoods. So we're continuing to work. We're continuing to work with the council member, uh, community groups, and the community board. And as the council member mentioned, one of our schools that we have that we're bringing online is the Harbor School Middle School in Red Hook. That site is still going through our public review process, and our public comment period is still open on that. Um, so we are continuing to pound the pavement, and we will continue to do so. Just to clarify further, the next school planned for opening in Sunset. Do you have that? Do. So the next school that we have planned to open is St. Agatha's, the former St. Agatha's in Sunset Park um, on 48th Street. That we plan to open uh, this coming September, September 2018. How many seats? We have 224 seats at that site. That is the first of six projects that are coming to the neighborhood. This September coming up. Okay, Wait, thank well, you, well, Melanie. Just, I just, uh, Melanie, if you wanna come back a little bit. I just, there's another part of this question that was important, which is, uh, this is gonna take some time to build. And so I just wanna make sure that there's a commitment from the Department of Education to work with community, uh, our community here, to make sure that as we build, that we take care of the current overcrowded schools and making sure that the needs that arise as we build that they don't get left behind. It's going to take, it's going to take some time I want to, to make address. sure, I want to understand that question because I think we have shared values on this, but, but tell me what the heart of what you're saying is. So right now, kids are experiencing overcrowded schools. No space for dance, art, music. It's going to take some time, four, five, six, seven years before all the schools get built. In that time, we will lose a generation of young people uh, from experiencing a uh, a, a non-overcrowded school district. Uh, How can we make sure that we bring the resources to address the, the students that are currently going to be going through elementary, middle school, in overcrowded schools? Okay, so I want to say, time. I want to say, I appreciate the question a lot, and we'll turn to the deputy chancellor. But um, I want to say, on behalf of our educators, 
even though I know you meant it in the best spirit, we're not losing any generations. I mean, the, the notion here, um, I, as I mentioned earlier about early childhood education, I think we were losing generations when we weren't even giving them pre-K, for example. But in terms of some of the uh, special opportunities that every child should get on the way up, the art, culture, science, et cetera, uh, our educators obviously try, even if they don't have the perfect facilities, to create as much of that as possible. So Phil, let's, let's speak about that. If you have a school that's overcrowded, um, it's a lot harder to do the things you would, you were a principal, you know this, it's a lot harder to do all the things you want to do. But talk about how a school tries to make adjustments to give kids maximum opportunity to have the, that enrichment. So harder but not impossible. I had the great good fortune of working for 27 years in this community in our schools and know how amazing the educators are in Sunset Park. Um, what it takes is a lot more imagination and a lot more flexibility than we would want to have to use. But it, we see schools using their space in really interesting ways to make sure that they can double up on different kinds of rooms. We see teachers using sometimes online space to do work around music and art where we'd like to have more physical space in, in a school building. We are committed to making sure that 3,000 more seats are coming to this neighborhood. The council member is correct. It will take a little bit of time, but we're relying on the, the intelligence and the hard work of our educators and the goodness that's in the heart of our students and their families to make sure that everything we can do that happens in this community is strong for our students. Thank you, and again, thanks for all the parents who are organizing uh, to continue to bring resources through participatory budgeting, technology, playgrounds. We're gonna keep doing that work right over here. I know you had your hand up forever. Good evening. The My Bravo family. Nora. Thank you. Congratulations. Do you have information on when the into 385B asthma bill protect tenants that suffer from asthma that are affected by indoor triggers? As tenant, we hope to work with you during the next four years. Last time you mentioned it, that it was going to pass in December. Is your administration still projecting to pass it now? Sunset Park tenants, and especially children, are being affected by this problem. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, some of you know in the game shows, you can call for your lifeline, so I'm calling for my lifeline here because I don't know the exact condition. Say the number of the bill again. 385. 385B, asthma. This is, this is oh, the You may, can you give asthma. everyone, an, this is you may from our city legislative office, can you give us an update? Or do you need to check? Not from, uh, not from city ledge, but I, I... Okay, I'm sorry, You're, but you know about city ledge. Yeah, so I mean, my understanding is that this is still, um, still being reviewed. Okay. Um, we're checking, we're yeah, checking. I mean, okay, so I'll, as we're you check, check that. so check uh, we that. had a Democratic conference in the city council today, uh, and that bill right now is in its final version for the, certain, the current session. Uh, we are go moving it through the city council, uh, and it has been in uh, multiple versions and processes, so, um, but we do have a bill right now in the city council that will be voted on on the 19th, uh, and so we are hopeful that we get uh, community support for that, uh, and I don't know if there's I don't know if there's any kind of administration response right now in the negotiations. Like we said, like so many other bills that are currently uh, being negotiated, there's a lot of uh, uh, conversations that are happening. So I don't know if the administration is, is ready to talk about that now. We're checking again. <laughs> a little checking going on. But it's an important point to bring up uh, about how we keep landlords accountable to having clean air in our apartments. And that, that's an important piece. Okay, uh, who from here wants to go? Okay, right here. Um, so my name is Maciel. I am an eighth grader in MCD8. And my question- School night. I mean, so what we've been learning in math is living and minimum wage. And my question is, would you guys like to participate in an interview explaining what's your opinion on living at minimum wage? Yes. Can we, we will schedule an interview. Thank you for the good work you're doing. We've been doing. doing a lot of work on, on, on not only minimum wage, but increasing wages across the Yeah, state. and I wanna just emphasize that because we were two of the people who believed strongly in, in increasing the minimum wage and fought for it at the state level. 
and also did things like providing more paid sick leave for hundreds of thousands more New Yorkers. So really care about this issue and happy to talk to you about it. Also, for everyone, 15-minute warning till the end of the forum. Okay. So let's see how We're fast we can go. Okay. We're going to try Great. and go fast yeah, now. Let's, let's go to fast questions, here fast in the answers. Back. In the back? Fast question, fast answer. Let's see what we can do. I'm really sorry. It's not fast. Try. Um, but <laughs> hi, my name is Victoria Hagman. I'm a real estate broker. And I'm going to tell you that the BQX proposal, so there's a couple things. I went to a testimony. I testified today at the um, vacancy rate, uh, economic develop impact of vacancy rates on small okay, storefronts. Okay, try and just get to the punch. Question, we want question, to really get to question. What's your key point? The question point? is, the BQX will trigger real estate speculation. That will, if you could make zoning changes commitments that those triggers could never be initiated, people would get behind expanding um, transportation through the BQX. But the BQX will trigger real estate speculation, which is what we're fighting in Brooklyn all over the place yes. and has been a huge Is there a question? Impact. Okay, no, I got so it. So how think, can you commit to okay, making sure that we don't lose manufacturing jobs, small businesses in the areas that will trigger these problems? Thank you, excellent question, I appreciate it. Okay, I think some of the dissonance here, first of all, there's a whole lot more public process before the BQX ever happens. So for anyone concerned about public dialogue and answers to questions and working through problems, there's a whole lot more ahead. To your question, um, there's nothing that I know of in it, there's no vision of a rezoning that would allow for more zoning than is allowed, that it could happen right now in this community. Let me just, we're not doing back and forth, I'm answering you. The speculation question, which I get, of course, there's been a huge problem all over Brooklyn. Um, but if you're in a community that has existing zoning that does not uh, encourage speculation to begin with, that's part of the answer. So again, from my point of view, that's true in at least much of this community. The focus on the areas towards the water is job creation, manufacturing, not residential, which is really important to discussion because when you talk about speculation, you know the history that is high, quote unquote, high end residential. That's not what's being planned here. The focus here is on job creation. So it's gonna be a much bigger, longer discussion, but my answer to you is the whole vision for the community now does not allow for speculation. That's why we're working the way we are. Thank you, uh, in the back. Sí. Buenas noches, buenas noches a todos. Eh, soy demócrata. Hey. Vote por oh, usted, no señor Di Blasio, y por usted, Carlos Menchaca. Sí. Muchas gracias. La pregunta, por favor, no, pregunta. rápido. Muchas gracias. ¿Usted apoya el rollback en la renta? ¿Otra vez? ¿Usted apoya el rollback en la renta, el 0% en las rentas? If you, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. My question is, if you um, support the rollback of 0% for rent. Big issue in our community. Thank you very much for the question. Let me, let me just uh, go back one question before I answer it. So there's uh, back on the question about the legislation on asthma. Uh, still a little bit of conversation going on between the city council and the administration, but we're all working in the same direction. So there's still some fine tuning, there's still some issues, but we like the bill and we are hopeful about the bill. So we're moving in the right direction. Thank you for that one. Over here, um, the way we, look, for years and years on the rent issue, which is handled by our rent guidelines board, that's for all of our rent stabilized uh, apartments around the city that covers all, more than two million New Yorkers. I believe fundamentally for years that system was broken and the board gave too high increases, too many increases to landlords more than they deserve, more than the facts merited. When I came in, we named a new rent guidelines board. We told them to look at all the facts, to look at the impact on tenants, to look at all of the different factors, and that resulted in two years where there was a rent freeze. Then the recent year, the rent went up a little, but it was only a little. When you look at all the years we've been here, much, much lower than the past. I will never, I wanna be straightforward and honest, we never commit in advance to what it'll be each year. It has to be based on the facts each year. But what has happened and never happened before in half a century was this board, if it believes a rent freeze is merited in a given year, it will do it. If it believes something higher is merited, it will do it. It's gonna be decided every year, but this time with the needs of tenants taken into account. Thank you. Next question over here. 
Uh, good evening, uh, Carlos and uh, Mayor de Blasio. Uh, my name is Javier Nieves. My question is, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership on a multitude of issues, but in particular to my homeland of Puerto Rico, that New York City has been uh, first responders uh, with your leadership. So thank you very much and continue support because it's in dire straits. Um, my question is really one more uh, uh, in terms of planning, future planning, because I hear all the issues regarding the, the affordable housing plan, and it's sort of a tricky word for a lot of people, affordable housing. Um, and the experience has been for a lot of the residents in Sunset Park and in other areas that most of the people that desperately need that housing don't usually qualify. And so Let's get there's a question. Yeah. There's a que there, my issue. My question is really about that. I never hear the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the word uh, low income or uh, low income housing, which has sort of disappeared. Okay. No, I disagree. So I appreciate the question. You're saying, are we reaching folks at lower income levels? Yes. Right. So thank you for the question. And look, um, the answer is yes. If you look at the affordable housing plan, it's all online. A huge swath of that plan is focused on folks at lower income levels, including incomes 20,000 and below. Uh, much of the plan, and this is where we see a huge need, is families that make 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, and that kind of range combined family income. A lot of working class families that are struggling to stay in the neighborhoods. But here's what I said earlier that I want to emphasize. The 500 families that have had their apartments preserved here in this council district. That meant their families from the neighborhood, already in an apartment, the city came in and said, we're gonna provide a subsidy to make sure your apartment remains affordable long-term, it's usually 30 years. And that the standard is you pay 30% of your income in rent. That initiative is expanding greatly. So that's the ultimate form of affordable housing because that's keeping people from the neighborhood right in their own apartment. Um, that's what you're going to see in Sunset. There's really not a lot of public land to build on in Sunset and in a lot of surrounding neighborhoods, so we don't have the option to build new affordable housing generally, except for that library site was a good example, but generally we don't. But you will see a lot more of the preservation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, over here in the back, Ms. Mayor Anna Nicolosi. <laughs> Carlos, Mayor de Blasio, thank you. Um, quick question. I haven't heard anything on seniors. I've been working in the industry a whole lot of years, um, entering seniordom myself. Um, we've heard a lot, of, a lot of responses from you for education, and they all talk about infrastructure and infrastructure having to do with the school construction authority. The infrastructure of the senior centers in New York City is crumbling beyond recognition. Is there a possibility for something called a senior center construction authority to come out of your administration? I like that. A new commissioner I like on its it. way. Very inventive idea. It's good to see you again, by the way. Very inventive idea. But I'm going to tell you my blunt response is not a no. It's that the even greater need is senior affordable housing, is nursing home space, is assisted living space. So. I think senior centers do, as you know, remarkable work, enrich lives, uh, enhance health, nutrition, there's all sorts of things. But bluntly, for seniors all over the city, the first crisis is affordability and housing. And there have been a lot of controversies around the city where communities oppose the creation of nursing homes, uh, for example, which I, I would urge people to really rethink because we're all gonna need those facilities one day. So what you're saying has sparked an interesting idea. I appreciate it, whether we need to coordinate somehow all the types of senior living capacity of the city going forward, because we just don't have enough. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, over here, a uh, question over here. Young man over here with the glasses. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Amir de Palacio, I, want, I would like to re reiterate uh, questions in the beginning of the session that I understand uh, motorized bikes is against uh, the New York City administrative laws, but a pedal-assisted e-bike is not. 
I have a friend who got a fine working a restaurant of $500. I would like to know if you could communicate with NYPD that if it's possible to stop fining workers with motorized, but uh, the pedal assisted, assisted e-bike. Thanks for that Thank clarification. You. Is there a excellent point? It's an excellent point. And when we announced the new enforcement policy, we made that distinction that the pedal assisted bikes are legal. That's absolutely right. Um, the central problem we've been having in terms of safety is not the pedal assisted, it's the e bikes. Um, but I think you're making an excellent point. We have to make sure each precinct knows the difference for enforcement purposes. So we will follow up um, with the NYPD. I'm looking around to see who's going to follow up. I think we're going to have our transportation commissioner help us on this uh, to make sure, let's, let's work with NYPD leadership to make sure the distinction between e-bikes and pedal assisted bikes is clear to officers in terms of how they enforce. And that, we can work on that. It's certainly been one of the challenges in the whole enforcement discussion is distinguishing between those two categories. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, these young people really wanna ask a question. You wanna uh, ask a question? Carlos, you got the, five yeah, minutes left. Five, five minutes. minutes left, okay, shoot. You ready? Let's oh. do this. My name is Nicholas, and I would like to thank Carlos Menchaca for helping us with participatory budgeting. Thank you for the thanks. Let's get to the question. I love you all. Yeah. What other projects can kids like us get involved, get involved in to support our school and community? What other ways can kids can get involved to get, okay. What, what are the projects? Okay, so, um, Okay, it is 10.30, and, and I just want to say thank you for that question. And I'm, in, my, in my final remarks, I'm going to come back and answer that. Uh, there's a question over here in the back. Yes. Hi, Mr. Mayor. We have a workroom problem in our community. Can you help us? They scare our kids and damage our properties. Say, say again, what, what is the problem? Raccoon. Raccoons. You know, here in rural Brooklyn, we're all living in, right? Um, Parks Department's gonna have to back me up here, Mitch. By the way, I am developing legislation on this gonna, topic yeah. uh, that I will be talking to everyone about. All right. Uh, I wish I had a great answer. We don't have a big, uh, or Mary's gonna join in. We don't well, have- if they're rapid, they have right. health issues. Right. If we, it's on private property, uh, the property owner must handle it on the property. If it's rapid, then you should call 311 and Department of Health will intervene. And rabid means behave. Don't make friends with vac raccoons. People. So let's, let's say that with more authority. If, if a raccoon poses a danger because it's diseased, an acting call strange. 311, yeah. Department of Health will step in. You know, we only do one thing with the, ra with the raccoons, though. We, um, we, more energetic, we only do one thing with them. We examine them for rabies, and that requires taking off their heads. Uh, is That's that, a way is, to is end that the meeting. Waking everybody up. <laughs> Off with All right, the we're head. At the end, Carlos. Yeah, we're, let's cut this. Let's, let's. That's one way. That was a mic drop. Okay, so <laughs> we are done with questions for the night. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, unfortunately, not end on that note because we're gonna give you some final remarks. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank, everybody. thank you for being here. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, happy hold on, hold on, hold on. Commissioners are here to get your questions. Uh, come, come forth. I want to thank all the young people that were here tonight. Can we give them a round of applause? The future of this district and this city. Let's give them a round of applause and all of you who came tonight. Thank you so much and happy holidays.